I think we are ready. Sorry for the slight delay here. I don't see Isaac here. Is Isaac Blair here? I don't see him. Okay. Okay, what can I answer? Here's the uh, study guide. Anything on there that needs clarification? Yeah, we'll do Hayden. Can you do a problem detailing uh, crack row given uh, your fracture toughness? Uh, I guess like problem one on the practice exam. Or so a note about that. Uh, I just saw the practice exam for the first time. I didn't look at it earlier. If you go to it, there's some there's some missing information. I just messaged Emily and told her to add it. She took that from a previous question, but what's missing is information to figure out the crack growth constants. There's usually a figure that goes with it. It was probably on the next page or something. But this problem one, you cannot solve without that figure. So hopefully she'll post that by tonight or something. You want to see one like that? Yeah. Worked yeah. out? Yeah. Could you show what the graph was? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this is a. Uh, okay, let's just grab it. Okay. So it says if a polymer has an initial internal flaw, one micron in size, What's a micron? One millionth of a meter. One so one e to the negative sixth. Okay? Or ten e to the negative six. Ten to the negative six or one e to the negative six. And the fracture toughness of two megapascal, is that a big or a small value for fracture toughness? Pretty small. Metals like steels and aluminums are 30, 40, 50. Ceramics are between you know like four and ten or so. Glasses are two or three polymers are low as well. So that's a pretty low value. It says if it's subjected to a cyclic stress between 90 megapascals and 50 megapascals, how many cycles would this polymer survive until fracture? Assume that the flaw is negligible compared to the width of sample. So where do you begin on a question like this? Let's start with the crack growth equation, right? So we know that eventually n sub f, the number of cycles until failure, is going to be equal to 1 divided by a times y to the n. I can bring y out because I said in the problem statement that it's small, right? So y can come out of the integral. That's going to be y to the n. Uh, you're going to have delta sigma raised to the n. You're going to have pi raised to the n over 2. This is the integral from your initial crack size up to your critical crack size, dA over a to the n over 2. All right, that's our generic crack growth equation. And the problem asks for how many cycles until failure, so that's nice. It means all we're going to do is plug values in here. The problem is we don't have all these values yet. We know the initial size, right? Well, we know that it's an internal flaw, so what's our a naught? If the internal flaw is 1 micron, well, that equals 2 times a. So a is that value divided by 2. So a naught is going to be, change color. That's going to be uh, 1 micron, 1 e to the negative 6 divided by 2 meters, right? Well, what else? We don't know AC yet. We don't know cap, like big A. We don't, well, we know Y. What do we know Y is? Yeah, that's going to be 1.12 because this crack is small compared to how big the component is. Uh, what about the stress range? Do we know it? Yeah, that's 90 minus 50. That's 40 megapascals. We know pi, so all we really need is AC, the critical crack length, and we need big A and we need N, those three things. And what was not given in this question is the graph with which you could determine A and N. So we'd have to have that. Yeah, question? Uh, is there any situation where you've not used the stress range? With crack growth, which is it's, it's cyclically growing under some sort of cyclic loading condition, that's when you use the range. When you're solving for at what point it fails, like the critical flaw size, there you use the maximum. <coughs> okay. So speaking of the solving for the critical flaw size, we don't know AC yet, right? We need to solve for that. Yeah, question? Uh, so if it was between 90 megapascals and negative 50, it would just be 90 to 50. It would, correct. Because it's going to grow over all, over all the, the times when it's under tension, meaning positive values, the crack will grow. Under compression, we're in this class assuming they don't grow. That's not strictly true. 
It's not a bad approximation for some stuff. Yeah, Spencer. A and N are just constants for that material. A and N are constants for this material. For, so for that polymer, what we would need, let's do AC first. First off, we know the Griffith fracture toughness equation says that the stress intensity factor under mode one cracking and the critical value of it, that's what fracture toughness is. It's, this, it's the critical stress intensity factor is equal to Y times sigma times square root of pi A, right? In this case, we're gonna solve for the critical value of that because we know what the load is gonna be, right? Professor? Yeah. Uh, so the cases where we can't pull out the Y of N are the cases where you will specifically say that Y is equal to something else. Right? Which will not be on a midterm. That's totally fair game on a homework because you can use a solver. That creates a really nasty integral to uh, solve for. So I won't quantitatively make you work through that. I do expect you to understand why can we bring Y out in the first place and what, in what situations would we not be allowed to bring it out. Those would make really great conceptual questions. I don't know if I put that on this what exam. I don't think I did. What are the situations where we can pull out Y? Um, well, you know that y looks like this. If you were to plot y as a function of a over w, again, w is how big your component is. A is the half crack length. If a over w is approximately 0, then y always equals 1.12. But if a over w gets larger, right, if it reaches like, that's by like 0.5, then it reaches, I think, a value of around 4. So if A over W ever grows large, and by large I mean not zero, or not very close to zero, then you technically should not bring Y out of the integral. Now in some cases it makes a big difference, in some cases it does on the thing on the homework this year, actually made a significant difference. It made a noticeable different difference if you brought it out versus left it in. Okay? Yes. Yeah, Brad? So when you just like if you solve for AC in that equation, you want to turn crack, and then you're solving for half crack. You are solving, A is the half crack length. That's that by definition, it's what's called the half crack length. If you have a surface flaw, then the total depth of that flaw is the half crack length. If it's an internal flaw, like in this question, the total flaw length is two of those. Okay? So yeah, we could solve for, like you could plug this in, that's two megapascal root meters equals 1.12 times 90 megapascals times square root of pi AC. So you could solve for AC here. What are what are you guys getting for that? 125.31. Well, what's it in meters? Oh, maybe it's, right, maybe Double check that value. I'm not sure. is is Somebody else getting that? 1.25 times what? 10 to the negative four. Okay, oh, yeah, that sounds about right. So you want to keep that number. Well, hang on to that. That's AC. AC gets plugged in right there. So that we just, <coughs> yeah, go ahead. Even though it's an internal flaw, you don't times that by two? Oh, no, yeah, we leave that as is. We leave that as is, right? You go up to the half crack length, or the critical flaw size. We just solve for the critical flaw size. Right, but it's an internal yeah, but we're modeling our crack growth from half crack initial to half crack final. So we can leave it as is. Like, it'd be a fair question to say, how big is the flaw when this thing breaks? And 1.25 e to negative 4 is not the right answer, because the full flaw is two of those. Okay. But we, in the integral, we're going from initial half crack to final half crack length. Okay, so, you don't the big so you do not multiply that by two. Okay. So we've got that. Now what we need is A and we need N. Or Matt? So um, in the K equation, the sigma represents mass stress. That's correct. Because when it breaks, it's under cyclic conditions, so it's oscillating. When is it going to break? It's going to break up to some number of cycles, but when it does break, it's going to break at the top of that cycle. That's the assumption we're making. At the highest stress is when it's going to break. And that's a pretty fair assumption. And so since we know this is ranging between 90 MPA and 50 MPA, we go ahead and plug in 90 MPA for that. Even though up here we use the range of 40 MPA because it's going between 90 and 50. Aliyah? So for the Griffith equation, we multiply 90 by A, 90 by 10 to the 6. No, because the fracture toughness has units of megapascals, root meters. Right now, here's our units, megapascals. That means when we solve for A, it's going to give us that answer in meters, which is what we want. So you don't need to mess with the units on that. That as is is good. 
Griffin. Um, N, what's N again? N and capital A, this big A and little N, those are what are called crack growth constants, which are specific to every material that you work with. Oh, so we get those. Well, in this question, what Emily forgot to give you guys is a plot to solve those. So that's what we're going to draw next. Are there other questions so far we've done? This straightforward? And again, I get it, this, like, it's, it takes work, but I think it's one of the cooler things we learned in this class, so I do want you to know it. That's why it's on the midterm. Okay, let's talk about how you would determine A and N. Those are the A and N is the crack the constants for specific materials? They, yeah, it's not like for all things they work. Sometimes they'll be given for like a family of materials, like these types of steels will have values. I think they generally give you pretty specific, like this alloy has these crack growth constants. So we have photos from a graph. So yeah, the graph that she didn't give you would look something like this. And you can do it two ways. There's two different types of plots I could give on this question. I could either give you a plot where it's actually dA, dN, let me redraw these, give myself one more room, versus delta K. But on that graph, I would have to have it scaled logarithmically. I'm definitely not drawing this accurately, but you get the idea, right? A logarithmically scaled graph means you're actually looking at the raw value of delta K and the raw value of DADN. And when you do so, you'll get a linear line. If we're talking about something that obeys Paris's law, which is this crack growth equation we've been describing. I'm only going to give you something that's linear, right? The other way to make that look linear is instead of plotting it on a logarithmic scale, I can give you a nice normal linear scale where like your m major and minor tick marks are spaced like, you know, normal things apart. But then I would have to have this be the natural log of DADN and this would have to be the natural log of delta K. Okay? So that's what you I could give you either one. Oh, yeah. Either one you could get linear lines and crack growth constants from, right? Again, this one you're seeing the actual value of DADN, but you're seeing it plotted on a logarithmic scale. This one you're seeing the natural log of that value plotted on a linear scale. Either of these are valid that I could give you, and either of those you could solve for the crack growth constants. Yeah? So uh, for the one with DADN, okay. uh, N is the slope of that line? Yeah, let's talk about that. So let me scroll down, give myself some room. We know that the equation is as follows. It says that dA, dN equals capital A, sometimes called C. In the other book, they called that C. I'm just going to keep with A. Multiplied by the range in the stress intensity, delta K, raised to the N. I think in the book, they call NM. Apologize. There's lots of, it's tough. You run out of variables when you're studying everything, which is material science, <coughs> the study of everything, right? So this is our expression. This is exponential, right? It's exponential, it takes off, right? As you increase delta K, this thing should just take off. But when you plot it in such a way that you plot it on logarithmic axes, something that looks exponential, you can make it look logarithmic or uh, linear. The way that you do that is by taking natural log of both sides. You end up with natural log of DADN equals natural log of A um, plus N times the natural log of delta K. So, let me give us a different color. That means that this right there, that is X. This right there is Y. This would be our Y intercept, which we'll call B. And then plus M, which is our slope. So if you've ever seen these Y, uh, you would have seen this, Y equals MX plus B. That's the equation for a line. The way that you make this thing look linear, meaning it, it can be fit to this, is by recognizing, okay, uh, let's do this one over here first. This one's easier. You already have natural log of x, is natural log of delta k as x. Perfect. That's what it should be. Y should be natural log of dADN. Perfect. It already is. So in that case, if you took the slope using the values given here, you could solve for the crack of constant n. And then if you plug that in and solve for a, you get that. Uh, question? Uh, I was asking what n is. This. Small n, capital A, are crack growth constants. They just describe how quickly your crack grows. Yeah. So do those correspond to little a and big n? Small n. And little a and big n, sorry, which one now? Uh, well, this, this expression is called Paris's law. It says that the rate of crack growth, right, change in crack length, dA, 
with each cycle, dn, okay. is equal to two constants times whatever your range and your stress intensity okay. is. Okay? So, yeah, question? So, for the values for like a and delta k that you plug in at n, you just take those from the graph? Yeah, let, let's do an example. Let me find a graph real quick. Um, I have to pull from one of my solutions. Let's see if. Um, let's see if I find something. So how about, well, we'll just do this one from the, from the class. Okay, let me copy this. Okay. Two options, we said we could solve it either way, whether I give you actual values plot on log axes, or I could take natural log of those values and plot on linear axes. Either one works. Which one do we have here? You've got log axes, but these are actual values, right? So fine, how do we solve this type of thing? Um, if you want to take the slope, right, this is the region we're talking about. You can use Paris's law only in that linear region, right? It's only linear over that, that region here. So if we want to figure out the crack growth constants for this material in this region, the way that we do it is we know that the slope of this should be proportional to n. So slope is um, going to be rise over run, right? Or the change in x, change in y over the change in x. But what is y equal to? We just said that y is not just like the values, it's natural log of those values, right? So let's pick two points that we can read off of here. Let's take that one, that one looks easy to read. And maybe, I mean, none of these are super easy to read. How about that one? All right, so let's read those values off. I don't know if you can see which ones I've marked. We're doing that one and that one. Okay, so how do you read those? Let's, what are these points? So in x, that would be 10 to the 1, which is just 10. So we have to go back 1, 2, 3 lines. So that's 9, 8, 7. So its first value is 7. That point is 7. And in terms of y, what is that? Well, that's 10 to the negative 6. So this is all some number times 10 to the negative 7, 10 to the negative 6, and so forth. So this is going to be 9, 8, 7, 6. Maybe like 6 e to the negative 6. Right? Let's do it up here. That one's going to be what? What's? So this is 10, 20, 30. And what about the y? And that's, this is 1 e to the negative 6, 2, 3, 4, 5, maybe 6. So 6 e to the negative, oh, I messed up one, sorry. 6 e to the negative 6. This one down here should be 6 e to the negative 7. I'm sorry. Okay? Fair enough. So now when you figure out the slope, you cannot just plug these numbers right in. You can't say rise over run. Oh, great, we've got our rise. You can't say, for example, 6 e to the negative 6 minus 6 e to the negative 7 because we haven't taken natural log of those. And the only way that you make this thing linear is by doing natural log of dA over dN. So instead you have to say natural log of that minus natural log of that. That's really bad. Let me replot that. Natural log of 6th e to the negative 6th minus natural log of 6th e to the negative 7. Then you're going to do the same thing on your x, right? Because your x, the only way that you get to do x is by having it be natural log of delta k. Yeah, question? So wasn't that axes dA over dn? Yeah, these axes are the actual values. This is actually dA dn. This is actually delta k. They haven't taken natural log of them. They just plotted them in a way that is logarithmic scaling. Okay. Fair enough? Yeah. So then down here we're going to take natural log of 30, and we're going to do subtract from that natural log of 7. Okay, what do we get? What's our crack constant n? So are you going to give a graph like that on the test or something like that? That we're going to have to that's play? what midterm was. The question was originally about midterm one. Um, that's fair game. To give you a graph like that and have you interpret it is totally fair game. So again, you could take, uh, I'll just punch it in real quick. See if I get the same thing. Mm -hmm. 
I get, uh, yeah, 1.58. So the crack growth constant for this material, N, is 1.58. And now that you know N, solving for A is pretty trivial, you just plug in, you'd say, okay, pick one of your values, DADN, pick any one of them. Let's say we want like that value, that's one D value of DADN. So you could say six um, E to the negative six equals big A, which we don't know yet, times delta K, which was 30 for that one. 30 raised to the 1.58 and solve for A, okay? So that is how you go about solving this. Yeah, question? Yeah, so for the other type of graph where the natural logs are you take in, you just calculate the slope as usual. Exactly, right? If this was, instead of being plotted on a logarithmic yeah. axis, but they took natural log of this value and this was a linear axis, you'd just read those points right off it and that would give you your, your uh, correct growth constant slope. Okay. Yeah, Takar? And then if you gave us the other one to solve for the uh, parent implementation, or can you scroll up a little bit? Okay. Uh, for the top one, wouldn't we have to exponentiate? I don't know what that means. The values because in the other one, if we are giving us a log log, you bring the n down. So you're asking, you bring the n down. No, because we're given the values already in ln, not for this one, but for the other one. Would we have to exponentiate? Oh yeah, that? yeah, right. Because this this is actually delta k. This is not. I see me. Yeah, if I gave you a plot that was the, that was showing values of natural log delta k on linear axes, you couldn't plug that value into here, right? Because this is delta k. This is not natural log of delta k here. So I, yeah, I see what you're saying. Uh, can I answer other questions about this? So if we solve for a, I'm getting two point seven eight e to the negative eight. I have, I haven't solved it. Let's punch it in real quick. Six e to the negative six divided by. 30 raised to what we just did before, 2.76 e to the negative 8. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so 2.76 e to the negative 8. Okay. So now that we know A and now that we know N, we go back up and we've got everything. We know big A, we know little n, we know the stress range. Now it's just uh, just plugging it in, right? Can I answer other questions? Okay, what else? What are the what are the questions you guys have? Yeah, Takar. Uh, can you scroll up to the um, the goal? So, can you understand what the equilibrium constant? Okay. Yeah. yeah, equilibrium constant. So the equilibrium constant, it goes back to free energy. The change in free energy, delta Rg, the change in free energy for a reaction, equals delta Rg naught, which is the standard free energy, or the free energy formation, right, for the reaction, plus Rt natural log of Q, right? We have a special scenario. When this is at equilibrium, what do we do to this equation? This left hand side we set equal to zero, not the right hand side, not, not this delta G naught, but this one. When this one becomes zero, that's when the reaction is happening forward at the same rate that it's happening backwards, so it's not changing. So when that equals zero, when this equals zero, we can write delta R G naught plus R T natural log of what we call K. So K is just equal to Q at one specific time. At equilibrium, they'll use the letter K. I don't care what letter you use. It's important to me that you just know that there is a specific value of this reaction quotient at equilibrium. Can I answer the questions? Yeah, Arthur? Uh, I have a, can we go over the one exercise in the third problem of our first semester? Do you have that? Uh, say again, so which question is this? The third problem, uh, or the third question, and the problem that was the hardest. <laughs> the eutectic freezing, the saltwater one here? Um, so this is a phase diagram question, and none of that is on this midterm, so I don't think we should use that for today. You can see the solution. Um, that's not on this midterm. I don't think anything about this is. So I want you to know this material. It's going to come back for the final, but for today's uh, review, let's skip that. Other questions? 
What else can I answer? Yeah, uh, remind me your name? Travis. Travis. Uh, just like everything about Larson Miller parameters. Uh, everything about Larson Miller parameters. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Okay, Larson. What well, first of all, when do we use Larson Miller parameters? What are they good for? What are they good for? Determining failure. Determining failure, specific type of failure at long lifetimes, typically. Yeah, they call it stress rupture. Like it's typically at high temperatures, typically for long times. And this is a great way by giving you one Larson Miller parameter, you can predict failure for any arbitrary time or temperature. That's really powerful, right? That's really great. Rather than having to try and look up who did an experiment at exactly 800 Celsius at exactly this pressure, right? Or strain on your component, or yeah, I guess like stress on your component. How long did it last? That's not gonna be reported very commonly. Instead, they give you a plot. They plot here stress versus your Larson Miller parameter. And it has some sort of line. It doesn't have to be linear. It could do something funny, right? It could do whatever it wants. In this class, we've only showed you ones where it's like either linear or kind of linear like that. From this graph, you will be given as the x-axis a custom Larson Miller parameter for that material. There is no one equation for Larson Miller parameter. They all have the same general type of equation, but the constants are different because they depend on your material, right? So if your Larson Miller parameter, so these again, this is a linear axis. These are spaced like normal axes are with major and minor tick marks, right? If your Larson Miller parameter is equal to, let's say it's the temperature divided by 1000, and this is going to be multiplied by the quantity of, uh, sorry, some value, let's say it's uh, 21 plus 18 log of small t time, where big T is in Kelvin, that's your temperature, and small t is time in hours. The two constants that depend on your alloy are these ones here, the 21 and 18. And I just made those up. I have no idea if those are even realistic. But those are the two values that change for different alloys, right? Then from this plot, you could have different values given. So let's say I said uh, at 900 degrees Celsius, how long will this alloy survive under 10 megapascal stress, right? So you'd say, all right. Figure out where you're at. Maybe this is 10 megapascals right there. So you say, OK, 10 megapascals. Okay, and then you do, you see where that intersects with your x-axis, and let's say it intersected, I don't know, that's like 18 and that's 20. Um, these are usually times 10 to the third, right? So that means it's maybe like 19 and a half times 10 to the third. So you could say 19.5 times 10 to the third equals T over 1000 times 21 plus 18 and because I'm writing log, that's log base 10 of time. That's just how these things work, right? So you could solve for t time. And I have no idea if these numbers will even give you anything that makes sense, but that's how you'd go about this. Oh, sorry, temperature is in, Kel sorry, excuse me. I said 900 C. So 900 C, to turn that into Kelvin, you add 273, so it's gonna be what? 1173, math? Yeah, 1173. Okay, so you could figure out time. Let's do it. Let's see what it is. See if it gives us anything remotely normal. And if it doesn't, I'm blaming it on the fact that I made up numbers. Okay, I get, yeah, that's a bonkers number. I get something to the 922 power, so like I made up silly values, all that means. Yeah, technically the value here, if you answer the question I was asking, it would be 2.46 e to the 922, which means I made up really bad values for my uh, large mole parameters. Tons of ways you can ask this question. This question. I could say, like I just did, I could say under a given stress and temperature, how long till failure? That's a common way to ask it. Or I could say, you know that this component has to survive 20 years. Um, what's the maximum stress it could be taken up to at 400 Celsius? So then you go backwards and say, okay, 20 years, turn that into to hours. 400 Celsius, turn that into Kelvin. So you can solve for your large Miller parameter. So that's gonna give you some value over, you know, on the plot. 
you go up and you see what stress that corresponds to. So lots of ways to ask questions around this. Spencer? Um, is, it always, is the T always in hours, minutes? By convention, the way I've most common seen this is temperature in Kelvin, T in hours. But the way that they'll do it, because there are exceptions I've seen, it'll usually say another parenthesis next to it, which is K and then hour. So then you know, oh, the two units for the two variables in here are Kelvin and hour. If they're not barbarians, they'll write something like that and let you know. Um, Logan. Yeah. So this graph here that you gave us, the whole graph is associated with 90 degrees Celsius. And that no. 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 Temperature comes in. That's the whole value of this. That's why these are so powerful. Oh, so you plug in, you give us the temperature. You can plug in a temperature. Yeah. Yeah, that's what makes these things really so powerful. There's a ton of information packed into this thing, right? Arthur? So you said that, for example, 0.1 and 18 are made of value. They're associated with each uh, material. Every alloy will have different values for those. Uh, is there like maybe a problem where you give us a document and we have to determine what these constants are? Yeah, that's a totally fair game. That would be totally fair game. OK, so what are the constants on this equation? Like, is the 1,000 and that's Sorry, what is it, 21 and 18? 21 and 18. Oh, yeah, these two values are these. These will not be the same for every question. Like, do they have names? Uh, I just, I've just heard them called the Larson-Miller parameter. Let's pull it up. Larson-Miller parameter. Let's see what the old Google machine gives us, right? So in this one, right? Here they've got something different. They have the Larson-Miller parameter. It's 23 and 1. No wonder we got such a stupid answer for ours. I put in a big number there in front of the log, right? This is just for something, though. I don't even, this is for 316 stainless steel. And they even tell you this technically only works over that temperature range, right? So, I mean, you can't plug in any temperature. This has been calibrated over that temperature range. Yeah, Zeb? You're always going to give us the, like, 23 plus the log, the I've never written a question where I had to solve them. I think it's an interesting idea. I probably won't. Well, it's not on this test. <laughs> It's not on this test. I think it's an interesting idea to have you solve for it. Like, I could give you a couple of these data points and have you generate your own graph, and that's kind of cool. Yeah, Logan? So the Larson Miller equation always takes that one T times two numbers, one. It, it looks something like this. Yeah, like all these ones that you pull up, this was on the homework, right? This one was terrible because that was in Fahrenheit, which is stupid. But yeah, they all look kind of like this. So will you be giving us a temperature value or a range when you have to figure it out? I will ask you a question that you can solve on this. <laughs> I might ask for the stress. I might ask for the temperature that you can take it up to. I might ask for the time. But those are the three variables that you can use on this. So, um, Other question? Yeah, well, I'm just looking at the same answer as you on the, the time. Okay. So I was just going to see if you could draw like, some simple math and see if I find out if I figured out To yeah. see it, how this math happened? Let me make yeah. sure I punched it all in right. Will you give us the equation format or do we just need to know that, how that's set up, like the equation format? This thing? Yeah. I think that will be given on the plot. If I give you a figure, that will be on the x-axis. Yeah. Yeah. Like if I was writing a test question, I might scroll through the Google machine and grab one of these things and just say, ask questions based off of that. Right? I don't know if these are all Larson Miller. Some of these aren't. Oh, these, that might be. Anyways, that's how I go about this. Okay? Yeah, Logan? So in some of our Larson Miller parameter equations, at the end they have times 10 to negative 3 or something. What does that mean? I did that here on this one. So again, the, so it's easy to read this axis. They do just regular numbers like 1 to 20. But then they remind you, hey, by the way, these are all times 10 to the third. So that's why even though we read, say, 19 and a half, I did 19 and a half and I times it by 10 to the third. So what if our Clarkson Miller parameter equation says times 10 to the negative? Because on some of the graphs, they Yeah, have so that's also common. It'll yeah. do. So what that means is that you need to multiply this whole thing times the negative third. OK. That's all that means. OK. OK. Matt? So what's actually happening So these graphs are they're powerful because what they do is this is for five or six different alloys. right? Here's your different alloys. It's basically saying for whatever temperature range that this is valid, and they haven't stated that that I see here, but for whatever temperature range that this plot is valid, you can arbitrarily pick whatever time and temperature you want 
and this will tell you at whatever stress that is how long that thing will survive right so let's say let's say you pick temperature and stress you could read for any of these alloys how long that thing will survive under those conditions right because things under time they're going to creep this deformation is going to occur really slowly that's creep um this will tell you at what point it's going to fail due to that creep happening which is pretty cool yeah yeah, th that, that's a good point. These all assume that once you pick a stress, that that stress is not changing. This isn't cyclic crack growth. Uh, creep has to do with constant load, just long times, and slowly deforming. Yeah, Thomas? Okay, so question five and homework four. Question five, homework four. Okay. Um, yeah. Solve that, so this is, have you seen the solution? This is posted. So take a look at that and if you're still confused, why don't you uh, come chat with me? Maybe our time is better spent asking, answer the questions. Yeah, Logan? So this Larson, is this the only type of equation or type of problem that would be related to creep that we've done about? There's tons of other questions I could ask, but they're not on this exam. They'll be on the final probably. Okay. There's just only three questions I can ask and we cover a ton of material, so. They didn't show up on this midterm. Watch your, wait for it. It's coming. Unless you're unless you're civil, and you'll always wonder how to solve them. Takara. So we need to know how to do any sort of creep calculations in this midterm. Anything that's on the study guide is what I'll be uh, asking you. And I don't have creep anywhere there. I do have Larson Miller, and that's a type of creep, but it'll be what we just described. Yeah. Uh, remember your name? Anthony. Anthony. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to uh, oh, homework four solutions not up. I will fix that tonight. Uh, if you could, you send me an email right now and remind me to do that. If I have an email, I'll remember to do stuff. If I don't, all bets are off. Uh, we'll do Spencer, and then I saw Haley. Hess's law. Yeah, similar. Okay, Hess's law. We just go to the internet for this. Let's see what Wikipedia has to say for us. Okay, Hess's law at its root is all about saying that when you're calculating either entropy, free energy, or enthalpy for a reaction, you can break that up into parts. You can sum up all the individual components of your product and subtract from it, summing up all the individual components for your reactants. So the whole products minus reactants, that's part of that. Another part of Hess's law says that you can do things in steps and if, when you, if you do it in steps and you add those equations together, you get the same thing as the end, then it's the same as doing it in steps as in doing it in one step. So for example, right, yeah, right here. Let's say, uh, let's, let's do this top one, right? If I wanted you to tell me what's the change in enthalpy for B2O3 combining with 3H2O, 3O2, B2H6, right? You could calculate that if you knew the individual um, enthalpies of formation for those things. However, if I didn't give you those, but I did give you these two expressions, three expressions, you could combine these three expressions together in some way in order to get that one. See, what are they doing? Let me make sure I'm doing the right one on this. Is there one more? Oh, yeah, but something's not right. Okay, so using these, you could solve for that. The way that you would do that with Hess's law is you'd say, okay, I need to do something to these four equations, reverse them, multiply them by some number, such that I get two borons. So where's borons in this? No boron, no boron, no boron. Two borons, and it's in the right spot. It's a reactant, so we leave this one alone, right? Then we need, let's do B2O3 next. B2O3, well, we've got B2O3 only in this equation, so we have to flip it, so we're gonna take the negative of that, but then we get this thing we didn't want, plus water, which we didn't want, so we need some equation that's going to have B2H6 as a product, um, but that's this one. It's already there. <coughs> we end up with three H2Os, so we need to get rid of H2O, so you have to use these two equations. So it's just a matter of stepping through those until such that when you rearrange these things, either flipping it or multiplying it by some number, when you add them together, if you get that, then you can add these values together again. You turn them negative if you flipped it. If you multiply it by a number, then you multiply that by a number as well. That's the that's the, the idea behind Hess's law. Can I answer other questions about it? Fair enough. Yeah, Matt? Yeah, sorry, let me make that bigger. I should have done that. Okay. 
Um, the subscripts, they're telling you what phase of matter it's usually in. So in this case, it's telling you boron is a solid, oxygen is a gas, this boron oxide is a solid. That's all that's saying. Or these subscripts, that tells you how many of them there are. That's an O2 molecule. Professor? Yeah. If we ever get a, a problem like this, is it possible that you give us too many and that we have to sort it through? Oh, uh, that's a fair game. I could do that. Again, these take time as it is, so I don't want to really chew up your time. That's not my goal. Matt, did I answer your question? I was, I was asking about uh, on the H's. Ah, uh, what did the subscripts here? I mean, so this one doesn't have any subscripts. Oh, up there. Okay. So F, when you see an F, that means that it's the entropy or the enthalpy or the free energy, whatever it is. In this case, it's enthalpy of formation. F stands for formation. So what that is always talking about, it's for an, a single component. So you could look up tables. Let me, um, let's do enthalpy of formation. So this is going to give you for an individual component what the value is, right? So let's just go to this one. Should have a table of some examples. Yeah. So for example, it says carbon in the graphite form, it'll give you it, right? Or you could scroll down and you could see copper in its elemental form. What's the free, is this enthalpy? Free enthalpy of formation is going to be equal to zero, right? Um, if it's a material that's in its standard state at the temperature, meaning that's what it wants to be anyways, then there's no change in free enthalpy, right? These are change in, in enthalpy. So it's basically how much heat is generated, like lost or absorbed, when it goes from its uh, state where it wants to be to the state that it's in. Well, copper wants to be in that state at room temperature. Like copper is already a solid in whatever crystal structure at that room temperature. So there's no change. But if you take something like, um, say, water, water's right here, make this bigger, at, at um, room temperature, right, they have a, uh, oh, interesting, why is that not zero? Oh, for pure substances, this is a compound, that won't work. Let's do one that's a pure substance. Let's do, okay, how about this? Iodine, at room temperature, iodine is a solid. You know that because it's change in free energy, change in enthalpy of formation is zero. Meaning, you start out with iodine as a solid, and for it to become a solid is nothing. So it must be the state that it's at. But for iodine to become a gas at room temperature or whatever temperature this table is compiled at, you have to change its free energy. It's changed enthalpy, right? In this case, it has to absorb 62.438 probably kilojoules per mole. Does that make sense? So once you have these, if I gave you a big reaction that has four or five components, some of them reactants, some of them products, you could look up those reactants and products in a table like this to calculate the change in enthalpy for the full reaction. So up here, let's go to this. The change in enthalpy for the full reaction is equal to the change in enthalpy of formation of your products minus the change in enthalpy of formation of your reactants. So the full reaction, has to, you have to have those individual table values. Okay. Yeah, Hayden? Um, I don't have questions about Hess's law. But I would, I would Any other questions on Hess's law before we leave? Aaliyah? So, um, which would be more variable? Uh, zero change in enthalpy or negative? Negative. Negative. Yeah, for free energy and for enthalpy, we want uh, negative values. And for entropy, we want the change in entropy to be positive, which means it becomes more disordered. The degree of disorder increases. Those are all lead to spontaneity. Yeah, question? It's a. Uh, Andy. Andy. So when you, you have to flip uh, products to reactants, you also flip the sign of the double H. Well, no, you don't. Like, so if you have this standard table, let's say the, the expression is like, I don't know, something plus something gives you HBr, right? H2 gas, one half of a molecule of H2 gas plus one half of a Br2 molecule gives you HBr. Since HBr is a product, you're still just going to use negative 36. But if it was a reactant, you'd, you'd use the same value because you do products minus reactants. That's where the minus comes in. So in these values, you just use them exactly as they are in the table. You don't care, oh, there's a product, I have to switch it or something like that. No, you just use the value as it's given. Okay, so for example, if I looked up bromine gas, which hopefully is here. Yeah, the bromine gas, it's zero. But if it had been like a positive number 10, still, you're going to do products minus reactants. You use the exact value as it's given. Okay? Yeah. Are we allowed to bring in our sheets that we had for midterm one and? Yeah, you get two sheets. Every midterm, you can add one more sheet. My, the goal of my course with the, the sheets 
is not to make it so you have to memorize stuff. That's not what I want at all. I just want you to organize your thoughts because if you bring in, if I let you bring in your whole notebook, people will just spend their whole time flipping through it. You'd run out of time. So my goal is not to make this prohibitively difficult. You can bring in your past sheet. You can make two new sheets if you want. Um, but I want you to minimize the amount that you're going to be flipping through just to save you time. Okay, other questions? Yeah. So like if you were summing up, if you had like the, on the other page, you had like the program yeah. stuff where you're like you're adding up some of the equations. So like if you flip one of those equations, you need to change the Then you do change the sign, yeah. So here, let's say in order to get this equation, we know that we had to flip like that top one. So instead of being a positive 2,035 kilojoules per mole, it would become a negative 2,035. Right? And these ones, like, also, so, like, if you had to multiply by two, you'd also multiply that. Number. That's correct. That's correct. Other questions? Can we leave Hess's law, or can I clarify anything else here? Okay, what else can we answer? Yeah. Um, can you describe how we're supposed to determine the, um, the uh, indice values for a plane given the x-ray diffraction? Graph? Yes. Okay. So let's say I gave you an x-ray diffraction. Let's actually look one up. So for any, whatever Google image gives us, right? Let's take this thing, right? So this is x-ray diffraction patterns of a DNA molecule or something, right? So the first thing is, since this is just a Google image article, I don't know what wavelength they're using. So I'd have to give you the wavelength. I'd say this is from copper K alpha, which has a wavelength of 1.54 or whatever, right? Let's assume that this is 1.54, right? That this is copper. They've labeled it for us what peak that is. I'm, 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 uh, how, how do they determine that number of peak though? That's okay, important. let's go the other way. Let's do, um, let me look up powder diffraction for, let's do a cubic material like LAB6, lanthanum hexaboride. This is a standard material. It's a standard material because when you scan it, it gives you really sharp peaks. So let's ask, ask this question. What is this peak right here? Right, what's the HKL? So again, we'd have to assume that, you know, we don't know what, cop, what if this is copper K alpha. Let's assume it is for a minute and test it, right? So if this is it, that's happening at about, looks to me like maybe 21 degrees. So let's, let's, let's assume that that's happening at 21 degrees. So let's come down here, let's grab this image, take it with us. Okay, so I don't know what radi wave radiation this is, so this may not work. But I'm, I'm, let's guess that it's copper K alpha. If copper K alpha radiation, then wavelength is 1.54059 angstroms. Okay, if that's the case, then we observe this peak at about 21 degrees. So 2 theta is about 21 degrees, right? So you could then say that theta is equal to 10.5 degrees. Right? You know that Bragg's law says lambda equals 2d sine of theta. Okay? So you could solve for d. Let's do that. 1.54059, that's in angstroms, has to be equal to 2 times d multiplied by the sine of 10.5 degrees. Okay, I get 4.22. That sound about right? So my D spacing equals 4.226, right? Angstroms. Now we have to, in order to figure out what HKL that corresponds to, what's the next step? What do we do? Yeah, there's that formula that relates D to the lattice parameter in HKL. Well, lanthanum hexaboride is cubic. So we can say, all right, 1 over D squared equals H squared plus K squared plus L squared all over A squared. So we still need to know the lattice parameter. So fortunately, that's why they use this. This material, first off, it gives sharp peaks, and its lattice parameter is really, really, really well known. So let's look up what it is. Um, LA, let's see. Lab 6, I'd give you that. Or I'd give you a crystal structure and ask you to solve for it based off the ionic radii. I could do that too. 
So lab six um, lattice parameter. This will be really well known. Yeah, so the lattice parameter is 0.4156 nanometers. That's at room temperature, right? Obviously, it's going to change on temperature. So 0.4156. So A equals 0 0.4156 nanometers, which is equal to 4.156 angstroms. So with that said, what is HKL? What HKL peak is this? Again, you could you could do this. You could say one over four point two two six squared is equal to H squared plus sorry plus K squared plus L squared all over four point one five six squared. What's that? What is maybe tell me this? What does this whole thing equal if you add that up? Seven point two. Is that right? That's, it should be close to one actually. Point nine six seven. Yeah. Zero point nine six seven. Which means why is it not exactly an integer value? This should be an integer value. The reason it's not is because we read this off a plot and we did our best to estimate it, right? Right, we read that off a plot not even very accurately. We said it, we said it looked like it's happening at about 21 degrees. Right? Therefore, this won't be an exact integer because we approximate it from a plot. Right? But it's about 1. So h squared plus k squared plus l squared, this can only be a peak in the, we're going to use curly brackets to denote families, in the, um, the 1, 0, 0 family. It has to be a peak in the 1, 0, 0 family because if you had, let's say it was 1, 1, 1, then it'd be 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared. That would be equal to 3. But that's not equal to 3. It's close to basically 1. So you could write 1, 0, 0 or you could write 0, 1, 0 or 0, 0, 1. Those are all the same thing. That's all the same family. Okay? So that's how you'd go about this question. Can I answer the question, Matt? That pointed brackets correspond to families of directions. So directions that are the same uh, crystallographic direction, just if you were to rotate the crystal or something. Yeah, Logan? Okay, so 1 this, uh, one over d squared, that equation corresponds to a cubic lattice. This square. only works for cubic crystal systems. Right. So we had that uh, chart or table that had all the equations that we use for different right. systems. And then also, this was for some networks or whatever it was. And you just said, oh, that's a cubic square. I just knew that one ahead of time. That's why I knew that we could do this example. So if we got something like this, you would tell us or you Yeah, us I'd have to tell you. Okay. I'd have to give you some information so right. you could know which D expression you use. Yeah, you're right. You'd have to know which one of those to use of the seven that are available. And of the seven that are available, I'm only going to have you pick from four because three of them are nasty, right. and I don't want to put that on a midterm. So yeah, so I'd have to tell you that. Okay. And then, also, yeah, Logan and Haley. Okay, just really quick. Can you go quickly over the, the brackets, the curly braces, the? Yeah, let me come. Let me wait on that. I'm okay. going to answer a few more questions about this, Haley. Um, can we use like periodic table? Yeah, you can bring your periodic table. I don't think you need it. You're free to bring it if it's uh, if it's helpful for you. Let me answer one more question about this. What about the next peak, right? If you were going to solve this next peak, what would be the HKL of that next one? The next highest energy. Yeah. Well, the, if it's a two, then it's going to be all. So well, the we, addition can, of the number we can test, right? Because just like with FCC and BCC, remember they had those funny rules on what HKL can be? They either have to add up to an even number or be all even or all odd. We don't know what that rule is for lanthanum hexaboride. I haven't told you. So let's just take a step, right? It looks like it's happening almost exactly at 30, right? So let's redo this. If 2 theta equals 30, then our D spacing is, let's do that real quick. D spacing is now 2.976 angstroms. So now let's take a look at that. Um, we can say 1 over 2.976 squared 
equals h squared plus k squared plus l squared over a squared, right? This process of identifying HKL peaks, by the way, on diffraction patterns is called indexing them. We're indexing the peaks. Uh, we know what a is though, it's equal to 4.156. That doesn't change. So when you square that, what does HK, h squared plus k squared plus l squared equal? Somebody get me that. 1.95. So approximately two. So now what's it gonna be? What kind of peak is that? Uh, not two zero zero because remember when you square two, if you were to take two zero zero and you square the two, that would add up to four. So it's gotta be in the one one oh family. Okay? That would be the same as one oh one. The same as one oh one, oh one one. Yeah. Because it's cubic, so it's there's the same. Right. Yeah. What if you were given some sort of condition such as let's say uh yeah, you could do that. that. That's I don't think I would do that on a midterm, just because it takes time. That works. That's a great homework question. It's not a great midterm question. It would take too long. Okay, can I no, one more question on this, Travis? Okay, uh, Haley. Then. So you were saying if it's cubic, you have to keep in the one family. Like if it's a two, you make two ones instead of using a two. Well, we know that when you add up h squared plus k squared plus l squared, if it was two zero zero, when you square two, when that adds up, you'd get four. So that can't be it. So it's got to be two of those numbers have to be one. And four would mean there's a. Well, four would be. You know, probably this peak here, this is probably the 200 peak, is this third one. You could double check it. Okay. Yeah? I have a question regarding the range of all the different types of uh, combinations you can have. Does it stop somewhere? Because technically you can have an infinite amount of spikes. Uh, the range of different, what now? Because if we have like 35, 35, 35, is that possible? Oh, peaks? Like, yeah. Uh, you can go, but what you see, and we haven't covered this in this class, but actually you can kind of see it here. See how this kind of falls off? Yeah. That that happens. So as you go to smaller and smaller and smaller despacings, you would only observe those at really high two theta values, and the intensity falls off. Also, think about the geometry of the detector I've shown you. It starts like this, like you got your source of energy and you got your detector, and they go like that. So how do you go past that, right? The only way you can is by using really, really high energy, and then they can. Well, I'm not going to talk about it. It would it will only confuse you. I'm not going to do that. So, for the sake of this class, I'll just say that. Or I think it was Arthur asked it. Those things exist. Um, they might have a, an actual intensity, but it might be so small that, for most, for all intents and purposes, normally when you plot these, it's usually from 10 to about 100 is the range that you're looking at. Will it be given the the rule of like? Again, I, I won't put that on a midterm. Oh. But if that was the homework question, yeah, I'd probably give you that rule. Maybe I'd have to say, I, maybe I'd give it to you index and I'd say, tell me what the rule is, you think. I'd be a clever one. All right? Okay. Yeah. Takara. I'm not going to give the x axis and q. I'll give you two theta. Okay? Other questions I can answer. Yeah, uh, Jeff. Sorry about the hands earlier. You're a good sport. It's on. Yeah, I had I had those in um, boards anyway. So oh, on the back of the chart. I'm sorry. Hold that thought. Somebody did ask about brackets, and I put it down to not forget. Yeah. Let me just very quickly. If it's one comma one comma one, that is talking about a specific point. You know that because it has commas. If it is one, one, one like that, that is a specific plane. If it is curly brackets, one, 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 that is a family of planes that all have the same crystallographic identity as the one, one, one plane. Meaning if you were to look at what the atoms they slice through and exactly what it looks like, they're the same. And then you've got directions are bars. So if it's like a one, two, one, that's a direction with this, not bars, square brackets. And if it's a family of directions that are equivalent, it's pointed brackets. Okay. Directions do not have commas. Is there another question I missed? Yeah, these would be fair game, but they're not on this midterm. They'll probably be on the final. I, I didn't hear that. Uh, in the homework, it was a problem of like an hexagon, and we had to determine the, 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 the like 
That would be fair game that's not on this exam. If it's not on the study guide, it's not on this exam. And none of that is. So brackets like that, pointy ones, that is a family of directions. Thank you. Yep. Wait, the last one, please there? Yeah, that's called pointed brackets. That represents a family of directions. <laughs> Curly is a family of planes. Square brackets is a single direction. Round brackets is a single plane, unless it has commas, and then it's a point. Okay? Uh, Jeff. Okay, so the yeah, quick bracket comma brackets is It gives us two CUK alpha values and, ah. and then the decay rate of value. This is a really good question, by the way. So in this question, You've got like a, imagine that you were given an x-ray pattern. I don't know if it's given in the question or not. But imagine that you have your x-ray pattern and you have these peaks that you expect for your compound at specific spots. But then you see something else. You see like this little peak right there, right? And so the question is, if this was like a gemstone on the ring, right? Your wife could be like, is this crap? Did you just get me like a crappy gem that has some impurity in it? and be furious, right? Or you could say, wait, 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 hold up. We don't know for sure if it has impurities. Maybe what has impurities is the x-ray diffractometer, right? <laughs> right? Instead, instead of having just alpha radiation, which is equal to 1.54059, maybe when you were generating those x-rays, some of these beta Wavelength snuck in, which I don't remember what it is. Does it say in the problem? Yeah, it does. What is it? 1.39225. So you've got a different rate, different wavelength, right? So because you have two different wavelengths, there exists the possibility that some of that beta snuck in there, right? You try and filter it out. You put like a nickel filter in front of it. That absorbs most of it, but some might still go through. So you can answer the question whether or not this thing is an impurity or it's an impurity from your wavelength, which means your gemstone's fine. It's just the diffractometer needs to, you need to do a better job filtering. You can answer that question. So we go back to Bragg's law. We can say, well, lambda equals 2D times sine of theta, right? So let's say lambda alpha for a given peak, H, K, L, that's gonna correspond to a very specific value of theta, right? Because this isn't changing, it's just some value, right? So if this is of alpha, this is a function of alpha, right? Or in other words, if I have a different wavelength, beta, then I'm gonna have the same 2D HKL, that doesn't change, but my theta has to occur at a different value. Right? So the question is, like, imagine that HKL is like the, the 111 or something, I don't know. And that this big peak there, that's 111. So it's a really intense peak. So even though there's not a lot of your beta in, uh, radiation sneaking in there, what if this one is the 111 peak from the beta? Right? That's what you want to prove to your spouse. Right? If you can prove to them that, then you, the, gem, the gem is just fine. It's just that your machine, you need to filter out that beta. So how would you do that? Yeah, what I would do is, I think it tells you where your most intense peak is. I think this happens at like, know, 20 or something, does it say? It's 2 theta is 10 degrees, and then it gives you the 1 zero zero peak. Um, is that the impurity, or is that the main peak? It's a small additional peak at 10, and 2 theta is equal to 10 degrees. And, okay, does it say anything else? Yeah, and it says that it could be a reflection of 1 zero zero. And does it say the lattice parameters of these things? Can I see the Although question? The oh, okay. Let's do that. Okay. So the question says, yeah, okay. So you've got the lattice parameters. You have A, B, and C. Okay. If you have A, B, and C, what crystal is this? This is um, tetragonal. Tetragonal means that one over D. Let me actually move this down. Give ourselves some more space. Okay, because it's tetragonal. We know that 1 over d squared is equal to h squared plus k squared all over a squared plus l squared over c squared. We are given a, we're given c. We're told what peak this is, so you know h and you know k and you know l, so you can solve for d, right? So solve 
for DHKL. Okay? Once you have DHKL, um, you know the wavelength of what it should be. So you can solve where what that theta should be, right? Now do the same thing, but work backwards. Say, okay, starting with the theta where, it, where we observe something, you know the wavelength, solve for D, right? If D is the same thing, as like if you get the same DHKL, then it's just your radiation. If you get a different value for DHKL, then it's an impurity. You got something in your gemstone. It wasn't pure when you bought it, okay? I was thinking why he gave us two values for the alpha. Oh, um, technically, it's not um, It's tricky. When you want to generate x rays, it's not like a laser pointer. Like a laser pointer, they're great. You buy them on Amazon. It's like whatever wavelength of light and you shine it, and it's just easy. It's hard to do that with x rays. It's hard to generate these very precise wavelengths. So if you do like um, x ray wavelength. Let's see. Um, emission. Maybe that's the right word. So if we look at this, this is what typically occurred. Okay, yeah. Actually, that's not even a good one. Let's find a better one. How about this one? This one's good. So for given materials, say copper, when you bombard this thing with electrons, remember, there are, this is like the whole like kicking people out of the front row of the theater. If I kick, pardon, if I kick Carlos out and somebody wants a seat, that's going to be some difference in energy, right? But you could say that Thomas here he doesn't have the exact same energy that Nick. As Nick, they have slightly different, and so they'll have slightly different energies when they jump down a spot. That's what you're seeing with K alpha 1 and K alpha 2. It, this is the transition from higher energy level to lower of two very, very similar electron transitions. Both are going to happen. K alpha 1 happens a little bit more than K alpha 2, but they both happen, and they're pretty close together. But then you've got, say, like a next row back. Yeah, yeah, next row back, higher energy. So Spencer sees that seed open, and Spencer could try and jump down. That's a totally different transition with a significantly different energy, therefore shorter wavelength, higher energy. So there's actually more than this, right? There's these little ones out over here. But when you build a machine like an X-ray diffractometer, you try and take advantage of K alpha one and two because these are pretty close together, that even though there's two wavelengths and therefore two solutions to Bragg's law, therefore you get two peaks, you get peak splitting. Um, K alpha, blah, alpha one, two, um, XRD pattern. Pull this up. If you look, if you really zoom in, yeah, especially at high angles, if you have a really good machine that has high resolutions, what might just look like this, and they're kind of just smeared together, you see like a shoulder. If you have a good instrument that has high resolution, you'll see that for every HKL value, you technically have two different sources of radiation, so you should see two peaks you should see two solutions to Bragg's law. So when I gave you that question, K alpha 1, K alpha 2, that's what I'm talking about. These are the things that you basically designed for. If you could cut out one of them, that'd be great, but you can't cut it out without sacrificing a ton of intensity. So most machines, we just deal with it. We say, fine, they're, they're both there. That means instead of getting a super sharp peak, we're gonna get kind of a blurry one where they're both together, or you're gonna see doublets. And we just say, that's, that's fine. But we can filter out K, K beta. Um, we can filter out this one without cutting into the intensity of these too much. In the case of copper, you put a little bit of nickel foil and this thing absorbs like crazy. Uh, different things, if it's a chromium machine, you put in, I forget what, I think molybdenum foil. Yeah? So then do you just ignore one because they're so close together, or do you do the, the DHKL for all three? Technically two solutions. You could do it, well if you look at them, the, the two theta value, if you solve, so again, can I see that? She has right? For the, let's say it's like the 111 peak. Yeah, these wavelengths are close. 1.5406 versus 1.5443. So they're really close together. So they're not going to give you a very different two phase value in 111. You can just ignore one, just do copper K alpha, and it's going to be very, very close. And again, the way that we see that is uh, technically these are two peaks, but you see them very, very close together. Especially at low two theta values. When you get up to higher and higher values of two theta, they start to split a little bit more. But at low values, you're just going to see one peak. It might have a bump on it, but it's going to be one peak. Yeah, I exactly. I missed your explanation. Why is there two different alphas? Oh, um, because what is that? all of these transitions are when you knock out an innermost electron, other electrons fall in. Basically, it's, you've got two electrons that are really, really close, but not at the exact same energy level. Okay. And so they both uh, are falling in, and they're slightly different energy levels. Therefore, the radiation they give off is slightly different. They're like right next to each other. They're very close in energy. Cool.
Yeah, Thomas. What's an example of cyclic loading? Cyclic loading? Yes. Um, how about day-night cycles on a bridge, right? A bridge has, like, it's designed or whatever, right? But then in the day it heats up, so that thing's going to thermally expand, which might put it under compression. And then at night when that thing cools, that might put the bars under tension, for example. So that could be an example of cyclic loading that just happens. Or you could design it to be that. Like, what about, like, the, uh, the spokes on a bicycle tire, right? If you look at a... Gives ourselves some room. If you look at like a spoke, uh, bicycle tire spokes, these things are actually designed so that when you're sitting on that thing, right, there's this force pushing down on it. These things are under compression. And these things are under tension, right? So they'll use these steel cables, which work great under tension. And technically, this is bearing all your load. These, and they might be a little bit under compression, but all your load is being borne by your ones under tension. But every time that thing rotates, they're taking turns being under tension and compression. Yeah. That answer your question? Yes, sir. And the uh, mean, do we, do we calculate the mean uh, signal or do we want? Well, that's not on this test, so I'm going to let me just be brief about it. The one that we use the mean for has to do with these S versus N plots, so stress versus number of cycles till failure, right? And you can see like this whole fatigue limit or no fatigue limit. For those, that's when you take into account the stress amplitude. And if the stress amplitude is the same, then the mean stress becomes the next most important one. So again, if your stress, I'm going to be brief about this, if your stress as a function of a you know, cycle is doing something like this, your amplitude goes from the middle of that, that's your amplitude, that's sigma A, right? This right here, that value is your mean stress, or sometimes they draw it with a hat on it, right? Okay? Yeah, the problem was which one to use. It depends on which question you're talking about. If it's for crack growth, then you use the entire range, right? If it's for fracture, using Griffith fracture, you use the top of this thing. If it's for the SN curves, then you use the amplitude. And if amplitude is the same for two samples, but one has a higher average, then you default to the average. That one's going to be what fails first. Okay? Uh, I think behind you, uh, Brandon. Okay. Can you show us about the lattice parameters for the crystalline structures and how the lattice parameters? Oh, yeah, okay. Can we go back to the x-ray direction just a little yeah. bit? Yeah, yeah, while we're here. Yeah. Um, so the last bullet point on the review is I understand that when a unit cell expands or contracts, our two theta values can mm. change. But it asks how the diffraction keys shift. Yeah, let's talk about that. Changes. That's a really good question. That is definitely on the exam. So let's say you've got your unit cell, draw like three of them. All right, so that's your unit cell and you've got these, let's say that it's the 100 family of planes that are contracting, right? That's your planes there. So it's this, in this case, your separation distance is really easy to see. We just say that D equals to A because we're talking about the 100 family of planes, right? So thermal expansion comes along, and you take this crystal, and you measure it at room temperature, and let's say this, let's say it's this one, right? That's what you got. You measure it at room temperature. Then you heated this thing up. What will happen to this heat? It's going to move. Which way? If your unit cell got larger, then D got larger. If D got larger, where is our expression? <coughs> right here. I just for tetragonal. Where's the cubic one? Right there. Right? So if D got larger than this, uh, uh, sorry, what do I want? Yeah, I'm so, no, you're right. I'm sorry. You're, right. you're absolutely right. So if D gets larger, this hasn't changed, so this is constant. So if this got larger, this had to get smaller. So you're actually going to see, you'd see it shift to the left. And a good rule of thumb is something I put on my note sheet. With x ray diffraction patterns, your largest interplanar spacings happen at low two theta values. So the biggest, imagine the biggest plane separation you can think of, those happen at low two theta. And the really, really small ones where the planes are really close together, those happen out at high two theta values. 
So if you take, let's do the other way. Instead of heating it up where it expands, now say I take that same crystal and I squeeze on it during, during the diffraction, which is something you know my research group we just did. We sent it to a national lab where they've got diamond anvil cells that squeeze on it. Since diamond's transparent, the light can go through it and you can measure diffraction. Uh, it's going to go the other way. It's actually going to get slightly larger because the interplanar spacing got smaller, right? So in that case, this got smaller, so that had to get larger. Okay. So the, the, the practice, oh no, in this homework, the homework from this week is exactly the type of question that you should know how to do. That's there's one very like it on the on the midterm. Is it number five? I don't remember which one it is. It's home. Let me pull it up. Uh, yeah, it's the shift. Right here. This one. So. On this question, I basically I say what the structure is. I say um, I give you A, B, and C, and they're different. Therefore, you know it is not tetragonal and it's not cubic. I think I tell you. Well, I show you because these are ninety degree angles, so it has to be orthorhombic, right? So the crystal structure is orthorhombic. And uh, part A, I say what's the theoretical density find. Part B, I say at what two theta value. Would you expect to see the reflection of the 211 peak if you're given the copper K alpha radiation? That's easy. You plug in 211 for HKL. You know A, B, and C, so you can solve for D, the interplanar spacing. You then plug that into Bragg's law using copper K alpha radiation. You solve for theta, multiply it by 2, you're in your business, right? Part C is where it gets tricky. It says, okay, now assume that this material has isotropic, meaning it's the same in all directions, linear coefficient of thermal expansion, and if you're given a value. I then say that you heat it up, so you know what the change in temperature is. It's 125 degrees Celsius. You know how much this thing expands with respect to temperature. For every degree Kelvin, it increases by seven parts per million, so seven e to the negative six, right? So what you need to do is you need to figure out what's your new lattice parameters at 150 degrees, right? By using this expression. You're gonna say that thermal expansion that the strain caused by thermal expansion is equal to your coefficient of thermal expansion times your change in temperature, which another way of saying this is like whatever your final length is minus your initial length divided by your initial length. So you could use this expression to solve for your new lattice parameters. They're going to have gotten larger, right? And you'll have to do, since these are all different values here, A, B, and C, you need to use that expression three times to figure out what the new lattice parameters for are for each one of those. And then now that you've got new lattice parameters, just solve for the thermal, solve for two theta value again. Plug them in, get the interplanar spacing, turn that into theta, multiply it by two to get two theta, and you'll see how much it shifts. Uh, so I'm Matt and we'll do Arthur. Sorry, that means linear. So again, on the homework this week, if you plotted like for sodium chloride, you plotted lattice parameter as a uh, function of temperature, and you got a bunch of points, and it was mostly linear. So linear can refer to two things. It can mean that when you do thermal expansion, that you're only measuring it in one direction. But sometimes they'll say that the coefficient of, uh, of thermal expansion is linear, meaning that it goes with a straight line. And it doesn't have to. Sometimes these things do funny stuff, and they'll actually be nonlinear. But in this case, we're talking about how much it, it goes in one direction. So if you've got your three directions of your crystal, each one of them is going to increase by seven parts per million per degree Kelvin. Okay. What happens if a delta T in that equation you just wrote? Sorry, what happened to delta T? Uh -huh. Well, you know in your crystal you start out at 25 degrees Celsius and you're going to heat it up to 150 degrees Celsius, so delta T is 125 degrees Kelvin. Right, because we're talking about difference temperatures. 125 Celsius is 125 Kelvin, since we're talking about differences. Right. Um, but you don't need it for the equals no, well, you do. You would say, so again, if we were to work this out, let's just work one out. So let's say on this question, the lattice parameter A is 3.906 initially. So, oops, 3.906 angstroms equals A at 25 degrees Celsius. 
So A at 150 degrees Celsius equals what? Well, we can say A 150 equals 3.906 divided by 3.906. That's equal to 7 times 10 to the negative 6 per K times 125 K. So you'd plug that in and you'd find out what the lattice parameter is at 150. And it's going to be a little bit larger. Nothing dramatic, a little bit though. And therefore, since it's not going to get dramatically larger, you shouldn't expect to see dramatic shifts in your diffraction patterns. You know, a degree or two or something like that is probably normal. Okay? Yeah? Um, can you like, calculate the density of something like that uranium oxide that you did in the Hallmark um, Yes. Let me show you something really quick. So we did... We did some science. So again, this is when I was in grad school, but here you're seeing extra diffraction of the whole peak, and then I zoomed in on one of these peaks, and as a function of temperature, I showed you what that peak does. This is a bad image, but the one is it. But you see that at room temperature, it's over here, and with increasing temperature, this thing shifts to the left, right? By the time I increased 1,000 degrees Kelvin, it had only shifted from around 64 to around 63. So you're not talking about big changes, okay? Okay, you asked about seeing theoretical density on something? Yeah, the ceramic, like the uranium oxide or something, it's not like the um, you, Do you not want to see uranium dioxide? You want something else? Well, I'm just, not, like, not something that's just a metal that would be easy Okay, let's do this one. This one's, this one's a good one. So LA to SR um, AL207. So lanthanum strontium aluminate. Let's see if we can find the crystal structure. It is, nope, just a bunch of nerds. Uh, let's try this. Crystal structure. Let's try that. Maybe? No. I know this guy, that's G-Fang. Ah. Uh, all right, let's pick a different one. Let's do, or let's do this. How about this? Let's find it. Let's find it. This is the best thing we ever did. Okay, real quick. This won't take long. Lanthanum, strontium, aluminum, and oxygen. We want at least four different elements and no more than four. Give it a minute. Well, thanks for a second. I hope this is cataloged in here. Good. Uh, it is. It's right here. So let's grab the sieve. So I could give you, for example, on a midterm, a picture. I could give you this thing. Let's get rid of the bonds. The bonds are not helping. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Okay, there's the structure. Okay, so that's your structure, right? I'd give you a couple different images of it. Can you make that bigger? So to do theoretical density of this compound, you know the formula was La2 SR Al207. So let's grab this thing. Would it be fair to calculate the out of that? Um, I'm not going to make you one that hard. Definitely not in this class. Okay, how would you do theoretical density? So we know that the formula for this is. Uh, I'll just type. I'll just draw it actually. The formula is rho theoretical, right, is equal to Z times molecular weight divided by the volume of the unit cell times Avogadro's number, right? So if I had given you A, A is equal to A is not equal to C in this one, so you had those values. So you could solve for volume of the unit cells really easily. It's just going to be A times A times C, right? I, let's assume that I gave you those values. You know Avogadro's number. Um, so to solve for the theoretical density, all you need to know is molecular weight of this compound. That's not so bad. You'll just note that this thing is lanthanum 2, strontium 1, Al, aluminum 2, and 7 oxygens. So you could calculate the molecular weight. That's not too bad. What you need to know is Z. Z is the tricky one. Z is what? It's the number of, it's the number of these that exist in that unit cell. Right, so there's lots of ways we can do this. The easiest way is to start counting the things that are easiest to count, right? So you're not gonna ever, ever, ever pick oxygen, right? <laughs> don't, don't pick oxygen, because they're hard to count. There's lots of them, and they're usually in weird spots, so it's hard to tell if it's inside or outside or what. So let's pick ones that are easy to count. How about the blue things? Those don't look that bad to count, 
right? They're centered on what's called an edge center, right? Which means what fraction of this atom is inside the unit cell? It's on an edge center. A quarter, right? So there's eight of those. So eight times a quarter, that's two atoms. And then you've got two that are completely inside. And again, this I know that just because I'm familiar with the structure. But if you rotate, you see that these two are completely inside the structure. So you've got two from the ones on the edges, plus two in completely inside. That's four atoms. So what is that atom? Click on it, and you find out, oh, that's aluminum. So there's four aluminums per unit cell. So what is Z? Z's, Z's got to be two. OK? Pretty cool. Whoa, I didn't get that. You didn't get that? There's two that four and then there's Oh, because there's there's <laughs> per formula unit there's two aluminums. And we counted four aluminum atoms per unit cell. So there must be two formulas per unit cell. Oh. Got it? So again, you could have picked the oxygens, they'd just be not pleasant to count. You could have picked the other two, but they share sites. See how they're doing this funny business where there's it doesn't protect super groups. There's two different colors of green there. That's because the lanthanum and the strontium share a site. They compete, they share a site, so you don't want to count that. Now you're multiplying it by some fraction. So pick the easy one. Pick the easy one. Okay? So Z is two? Z is two in this one. So you could calculate density. Um, okay, what else can I answer? Yeah? Can we do like coordination number when there's like two different kinds, like can I add an ion? Yes, yes. Um, Let's briefly, while, we, while we've got it up, let's talk about coordination number with this real quick. Let's start with the aluminum. Let's make a bond. Aluminum bonded to oxygen. Let's add those. Okay. Oh, sorry, I gotta change my bond length. The default value for bond length, I think is funny. It's like so small, like that wouldn't be anything. That would be barely carbon. I think it's silly that they make that. 1.6. Okay, right there. So if you do polyhedra, what is the coordination number of aluminum in this compound? It is six. It's each each uh, aluminum has six uh, oxygen nearest neighbors. Okay, let's change it. Or yeah, let's change it now. Instead of aluminum, let's say what about strontium? Um, what are these ones? It's not nice, but you could count them. And there's two different ones if you did count them. One of these has nine. One of them has twelve. Uh, I got to make it bigger to to show you it. Even bigger? No? I guess I gotta do lanthanum. Yeah. So that site, remember this is lanthanum and strontium sharing a site there. This thing has 12 nearest neighbors. If you count the oxygen, it would be 12. This site only has nine. So the bigger your ion, it's gonna have more coordinated around it. These are for complex structures. You will not have to do this on the midterm. Let's go to ones that you'll see on the midterm. RC over RA ratio. So on these ones, I could say give you, what's a simple ceramic you guys want to do? Let's do calcium fluoride. No, we did that on, on something. Let's do uh, molybdenum oxide. Perfect. <coughs> molybdenum, uh, sorry. Oh, aluminum oxide? Let's, let's do aluminum oxide. That, that also works. It's not quite as exciting. Not quite as, quite as exotic. Why is this not working? Oh, guys, something terrible is happening. I have such a love-hate relationship with this thing. Hold that thought. Close all this nonsense. All right, starting with them. Yeah, it's mad about so something. Can I ask, like, will you have solutions to the second practice midterm and like all our homework by tomorrow? Emily's going to post the midterm. I don't have any. The practice midterms, that's totally not me. That's the TAs do that out of the goodness of their hearts. So I think she'll have something. But all the solutions of the homeworks will be up by tonight. I'll have those up as well as this video on YouTube. So again, let's try and draw this. Hopefully it works. Oh, come on. Why does, this, why does that not work? All right, let's try our tried and true method. Switch the battery, put it in the wrong way. Undo it. 
This doesn't work. I don't know. I, I don't know what causes it. I'd say I'd borrow yours. Because it seems like I do that and every time it fixes it, which seems like the stupidest solution that you reverse the polarity on the pen magnet, well, pen battery, and then it fixes it. But there you go. Microsoft. AL203. So in this case, I would have to give you the radius of aluminum. That's, that's aluminum 3 plus because we know that this is a total of negative 6. And there's two of these, so that must be plus 3 for minus 2 oxygens. We need the radius of oxygen 2 minus, right? So I would have to give you those, for example. So I would get them by looking them up on Rom's website. And we'd go to aluminum, and it has 3 plus that exists in three different states. I know what the structure of aluminum oxide is. I know that it's 6 coordinate. You guys don't know that yet. But when I give it to you, I'm going to give you this value instead of these because I know this is the one that will give us the right value for it. So I'll say that aluminum 3 plus is 0 0.535. That's angstroms? Angstroms. And then I look up alum, uh, oxygen. Oxygen 2 minus. Um, they're all pretty close. They don't change that much. So I'm just going to give you 1.35. So if you were going to try and predict what crystal structure this thing had, first thing you do is take the RC over RA ratio. The radius of the cation divided by the radius of the anion is equal to 0 0.535 over 1.35, which is somewhere around a third, right? What's the actual value? 0 0.396. So then you would go to your table. Um, I don't think I'm going to give you that table. So we got to do some drawings? You would, not drawings, but just write this, uh, these values way up here. Oh, just past it. Right there. I would just write these, just write this information right there. Our value is 0.39. So that lies between this and that. So in that case, we would have predicted for this a coordination number of four. And that's incorrect. So I used the wrong value for my oxygen. What if it was, let's try 1.4. What is it? Did we, did we punch that in correctly for sure? Let's do 1.4 for this. Let's say our auction was slightly larger. 0. 0.38? Yeah. Went the wrong way. Well, this one didn't work right. This is a, an approximation for predicting crystal structures. It's far from perfect. Uh, my student and I were actually writing a review article where we talk about all the things that have been done to predict structures and say how imperfect they are. And then we built a computer model that predicts it, which is pretty rad. Um, this one, you'd have gotten it wrong. Because you would have said, you would have had good reason to think that the coordination number is four. And I know for a fact that it is not four, it is six in this structure. But you'd have, been, you'd have gotten the right answer if you put four, because that's what was predicted. Okay? Most of the time this works, we found one where it didn't work. Yeah. So you're doing like the coordination of our like visually, just looking at something. Okay. Um, I guess I'm a little confused, like when you have to consider stuff that's not actually in your unit cell, or like the ones that are around. You, how to do that? Does that make sense? You always have to consider everything that's nearby, even if it goes outside of its unit cell. So a good example of this is with the uh, perovskite. Or yeah, let's do perovskite. Let me just draw it. Okay, the perovskite crystal structure. You've got it's cubic. You've got the big A cations sitting on the corners. Right? You have the small cation in the very center. And then you've got your oxygens on the faces. Top, left, right, back, front, bottom. Right? So if you wanted to, if I asked you what's the coordination number of the A ion, this thing right here, if you only look inside the unit cell, you're not going to get the right answer, right? You're going to say, well, what's closest to it? The thing that's closest is this oxygen, that oxygen, and that oxygen. So you'd say, oh, coordination number three. But you really can't do that. You have to consider its neighbors, right? You know that there's another unit cell right next door that that thing is a part of, right? And you know that there's ones behind it, right? Well, yeah, I'll show you why, though. So are you considering the center? 
if coordination number comes from what is the closest atom and then how many of those exist at, a, at the same distance. So in this one, the distance is from halfway along the face center. And that is the same for all of these. You know, I haven't drawn it wonderfully, but that distance is the same for all of these. And I could go on, right? I could sound this back face over there. There's another one. And that approach will get you to um, 12. So you're going from like the middle of the one to the middle of the other? Like yeah, of the atoms themselves. Now, somebody said, can you just multiply by four because there's four of these unit cells? No, you can't because that would be double counting because this unit cell and this unit cell, they share that oxygen in the middle of the face, right? So then that would be four times three, we have to divide it by two. So that wouldn't work. Yeah. Are there any pixel structures on top of that as well? That's exactly right. This thing has four above it. So you'd have to do four times three for your crystals, right? It's sharing between eight cells. So it'd be, sorry, so it'd be eight times three per cell. That's 24. But then you count that each of the ones is shared by two. So then you divide that by two. Eight times three is 24, divided by two is 12. So that's where the 12 comes from here. Okay? Yeah. Takara? Well, you asked us to like, name it, name the actual structure, like block salt. The ones that you will need to know the names of are here on the, what do you call it, the study guide. I added this a little bit later, so I apologize. You still had a few days, though. You'll need to know FCC, BCC, HCP, perovskite, zinc blend, and diamond. That's really not that many. Why about the etc. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fair question. Um, you won't need to know rutile. Oh, cesium chloride and rock salt. Cesium chloride and rock salt, these, these are both fair game. What are we supposed to know That's about? it. Like their their well, if I showed you a picture, could you name it? Could you, if I gave you the ion, the ions and the, the radii of those ions, could you tell me the lattice parameter? That sort of stuff. Basic, the basic geometry of those crystal structures, I expect you to know. Trax? Uh, can you calculate the lattice parameter of a, uh, like a zinc blend structure or something like that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> zinc blend is uh, this guy right here. Let me just grab it. Do we, do we class every single one in the last round? Um, yeah, I think so. Bingo. Yeah, diamond is zinc blend. But the only difference between diamond and zinc blend is they're all one type of atom, which we did talk about. Right? If all these, instead of having yellow and gray, if they're all one or the other, that is the diamond cubic lattice. Or in other words, zinc blend is the diamond cubic lattice where you've substituted these to be two different atoms, right? So how do you figure out the length here? Well, they're clearly touching right there. This is at the position zero, zero, zero. This one's at the position quarter, quarter, quarter. If you don't remember that, that's something that goes on your note card. That's just you, just, you just need to know that. But this thing is at quarter, 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 zero, zero, zero. And therefore, they're touching, because it's quarter, 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 they're touching along the body diagonal. Right, this point is quarter, quarter, quarter. This point would be half, half, half. That would be three quarter, three quarter, three quarter. That would be one, one, one. This is zero, zero, zero. They're all along the line there, right? And you know what the length of that line is. We've done it a couple times in class. You know, if you're looking at a uh, along just a face, that's A and that's A, that this here is root two times A. And then if you take along that whole section there, that whole plane, now you've got root two A is your lower part of that rectangle, that's A. Therefore, that line, which is the body diagonal, is root three times A. And then on that body diagonal, that would be halfway across, that's a quarter of the way across. You've got an atom here and you've got an atom there. So that distance from there to there, that's root three A divided by four. Oh, it's obviously gone. It's heartbreaking. It's so sad. This distance right there is root 3a over 4, and that equals the radius of your cation plus the radius of your anion. Okay? This is zinc blend. Again, it'd be the same for diamond cubic. Um, yeah. Other questions? It would be the same for diamond cubic, but instead of having a cation and an anion, you only have one ion because diamond cubic only has one atom. It's either like silicon or carbon, those crystallized in diamond cubic. So would it be two, like, It'd be two of that, yeah. So if this was like 
And if this was silicon, for example, you'd say the radius of silicon plus the radius of silicon equals that. So you could solve for the lattice parameter. Yeah. So if we were provided like a question about this on the midterm, would we have a picture, or would we just be given like the like components? And could do it either way. It? I could do it either way. I could describe it and have you try and visualize it, or I could give you a picture. Right. Yep. If you do give us a picture, would, is it possible that you would give us a hard square model? Uh, like this, or actually blown up and larger. Blown up larger is harder to see because it covers up some of the atoms. This is this is the best I think for. I'll pick one where you can easily visualize it. Yeah, and it's nothing. It's not going to be anything you haven't seen before. You know where all of these different structures touch. We've talked about it, right? All of these, what six or whatever, you know where they touch. So you should be fine. Yeah, Travis. Why was it root three and not root two? So let's just draw it. Let's do it. Let's draw it. So let me change and do that plane there. This distance, we just decided that's root 2 times a. That distance is just a. So if you do Pythagoras theorem, it comes out to root 3a. Okay? Questions? Spencer? Can I show a perovskite? Yeah, we just did. This is perovskite right there. Or uh, if you want, we can actually look at a better drawing of one. That's perovskite right there. So again, in a perfect, or what we call an ideal perovskite, this thing would touch that, right? That's half of the lattice parameter. Since this is in the dead center, and that's on the bottom, dead centered, that would be half of the lattice parameter is equal to the black atom plus the white atom radii. And if it's a perfect lattice, a perfect uh, perovskite, then along this, half of the face diagonal, so root 2a over 2, would be equal to the white atom plus the yellow atom radii. Okay. Other questions? For, for what one in particular? Oh, yeah, we worked through them in class. Yeah, they're in there. Other questions? For the perovskite? You could solve it two ways. You could say, if I gave you the radii of the yellow and the white atom, then you would say, well, they touch along this direction. And that is equal to root 2 times a divided by 2. Because this whole distance, that's root 2a. It's going half that way. So you could solve it that way. Or if I gave you the radii of the black and the white atom, they're going to touch halfway up the lattice parameter. This is the dead center. That's centered below it, but on the bottom plane. So that's half. Between those, it's half of the lattice parameter. Radius black plus radius white. Yep. Oh, Jeff? What about that modern factor calculation? What about which one? It's fair game, but it's not. It's not on there. It's not on the study guide, so you don't need to study it. What's not on the thing? Tolerance factor. Right? This can be perfect or it can be distorted. That's not on the study guide. It's interesting. It's not on the study guide. So even if it's distorted, the black one and the white one will touch, but not the white and yellow. It, it messes things up. Uh, we won't talk about that just yet. Wait till we get to electronic properties. Like seven more chapters. We're getting there. And for C, uh, for a Celsius floor structure, that's just like uh, halfway, right? Cesium chloride? Yeah, that's, that's this one. They touch halfway across the body diagonal. Body diagonal is root 3a. Root 3a over 2 is equal to the red plus the green radii. Other questions? Got time for like one or two more. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> No, nope. everything we've talked about all these things, and I can't think of something that jumps out to me that we haven't covered. Yeah, so, Arthur. Etc. is the last thing that's just like cesium chloride and rock salt. And rock solid. Rock salt. <laughs> that's a cooler name, though. <laughs>
not yeah. really related to the midterm, but that lantern on the wall side, or I don't know what the entire structure was. It looked similar to Frost Bank. Does it have similar yeah. properties? <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, it, it is like a Perovs guy. Let me show you. Wait, this is he had a, he asked a great question. The Ruddles bin popper rock salt Perovs guy. Check it out. That structure that I showed you, the Lanthanum strontium illuminate. This is my whole PhD, so bear with me. I'm excited about it. <laughs> I did a lot of this structure. Um, it can be thought of as having slabs. It's got a slab of Perovs guy. And it's got a slab of rock salt. And it's got two slabs of rock salt, and it's got one slab of rock salt. And you can change the number of slabs here. Um, it's called a homologous series, like right here. You can change it where there's just one slab of rock salt, or two, or three, or four, and it changes properties. They'll call this crystal chemistry, where you can tweak things like that and change crystal structures, and then that changes properties, things like magnetic or optical or whatever properties. Okay, anything else? I'm going to wrap this up real quick.